Welcome to the Top Business Leader Show, powered by Rise 25 Media. We feature top founders, executives, and business leaders from all over the world. Chad Franzen here, co-host for this show, where we feature top restaurateurs, investors, and business leaders. This is part of our Spot On series. Spot On has the best-in-class payment platform for retail, and they have a flagship solution called Spot On Restaurant, where they combine marketing, software, and payments all in one. They've served everyone from larger chains like Dairy Queen and Subway to small mom-and-pop restaurants. To learn more, go to spoton.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. We help B2B businesses to get ROI, clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships through Done For You podcasts. If you have a B2B business and want to build great relationships with clients, referral partners, and thought leaders in your space, there's no better way to do it than through podcasts and content marketing. To learn more, go to rise25media.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. Chris Tripoli has opened 100 restaurants in his career as an owner-operator, developer, designer, and consultant. He found a la, call, a la carte food service consulting group. He writes for Restaurant Startup and Growth Magazine, RestaurantOwner.com, and teaches courses in the art of opening and expanding restaurant brands. Hey, Chris, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you? Chad, thanks for having me. I'm doing just fine. Hey, uh, before we dive into what you're doing now, tell me about a la carte food service consulting group where you were president for more than 25 years. What led to your involvement with that? And what are some milestones from your time there that you're particularly proud of? Oh, great. Yeah, great. Well, I think I sort of morphed into doing that. I had been doing concept development uh, before formally developing a consulting group to do that. Um, that led to some really good uh, concepts. Uh, I was working with an entertainment management group and we created True Lux, which is um, a, a really good uh, high-end seafood restaurant concept. And at that time, we just did the first one or two in Texas. They've since gone you know, beautifully and expanded to five states, 13 restaurants or so. But um, uh, And after that experience, uh, I moved on and started doing development work on a contract basis for people and saw a tremendous need for that small independent that did not have the home office. Uh, they don't have HR planning, finance planning. They don't have in-house CFOs or, um, uh, or operation directors because they just have two or three stores. So I decided if I could just put together a consulting group and manage those services for small guys who still need that. They still need accurate budgeting, people development. They still need training and they still need concept expansion. So that's what led to it, just sort of filling a need and following my interest. Um, what really, I guess, some, some of the trademark uh, projects that I can think of is where we developed uh, independently owned restaurants in non-traditional locations by putting small hands-on restaurant operators in parks, arenas, uh, working on airports, you know, that used to be land of only the big boys. I mean, if you weren't the Marriott host or the SSP or, a, you know, large contractor like that. And so it, it was not easy, but we were able to break into that and help bring very small, really good independently owned brands into that arena. Um, and, uh, and I guess uh, next to that, I guess, was the international work. Um, it was amazing to me that small businesses around the world um, were, wanted to operate their restaurants in a way that could compete with American chains. And so I answered that call and got to do restaurant uh, work from Canada to the Caribbean, from South America, Mexico, uh, Central America, the Middle East. Um, and I always found those uh, projects very challenging because, you know, <laughs> you're, you're in a market where you have to learn, um, you know, the, uh, the clientele. Uh, you don't understand the customs. You have no purveyor contacts. Uh, and yet your client is looking at you to help them succeed with their idea. So those were a couple that come to mind that were particularly uh, satisfying. So you traveled to all those places? Yes, sir. What uh, is there a, like a, a memory that stands out for um, during one of those experiences that's kind of particularly unique, maybe eye-opening, something like that? Oh, oh yeah. The, the first one that comes to mind is I was working with a client who's become a dear friend now. Uh, uh, Darwish El Qadra, who was in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. And on one of our trips, we took a day. And he took me into their local market. Um, and I, that was tremendously eye-opening. 
just to see how they operated their farmers markets and to see the types of produce and the collection of figs and olives and different things that looked familiar to me, but all had different names. And I was just going crazy, asking questions, tasting this, tasting that. And he finally had to come up to me and tap me on the shoulder and said, you know, listen, if you would talk a little less, you'd blend in a lot more. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I was like a kid in a candy store, you know. <laughs> hey, uh, so, so um, you know, you were there for 25 years. What led to your uh, decision to sell a la carte food service consulting group? Um, I, I got to a point where my wife and I had decided we'd like to slow down a little, which is what we'll call retirement, I guess. It's a... Uh, um, we decided that uh, she had a very successful small business, too, that she had operated separate from food service. It was in corporate housing. She did real well with that for about 30 some years, but she was done. Um, she was recuperating from cancer and said, you know, w work is about done. And so I agreed. I said, you know what? It's time for us to just slow down. And so the good news is she's feeling wonderful. Uh, she's recouped. And uh, we did. We retired. So I sold a la carte to people who were working for me at the time. So that allowed the small group to continue, provide the same services, but allow me to retire. I mentioned that you have been a part of opening uh, over a, a hundred brands. Um, can you, you know, give us an idea of what some of those brands are? I know some of them may be some of the ones you're most proud of, maybe some of the ones we've never heard of, but maybe give us some of, an idea of what some of those brands are. Well, yeah, and, and some of them have, you know, developed, and I'm very, very proud of the way they've developed. You might uh, know a salad bar concept called Salada. Uh, Salada started, we went to work for him right after he opened his very first concept, and we had a lot of operational work to do and structuring and systems. And uh, by the time we got all of that organized, we got him registered for franchising. Um, and by the time he and his brother opened up the second store, we had him registered, done, ops manuals ready, franchise program written, and he was off to the races. And so today he's in, gosh, I don't know, five states. He has over 70 some salad bars open. He has another 40 or 50 uh, franchises sold. Um, and so that, that's one that I have a particular pride level for. I also love looking at Freebirds, the burritos. Um, I had fun with them, went to work in College Station for Pierre Dubé right after he opened the first one and did similar work. You know, we had to do some structure and systems and, uh, and growth planning. And uh, as the growth planning and fundraising occurred, then came the second, third, fourth and ensuing sale. And, you know, they're everywhere. So but some of my more uh, satisfying ones would be, say, maybe even the smaller ones that don't necessarily become regional or national. Um, but working with Lynn uh, Gwynn uh, and his wife, Tracy, in Alexandria, Louisiana, a small secondary market where they just wanted to be the quality, uh, casual, full-service anti-chain. So see, so that's tremendously satisfying to get to know people really well and work with them on a long going basis and, and see them reach their goals. Uh, they are operating well and they're profitable and they've since spawned off into a second pizza concept. And so, you know, things like that, um, you know, trigger um, happiness uh, to see uh, um, um, generations continue. Uh, uh, there is a restaurant, I think, in its 50 or 60th year now, I, I, I think, called Nico Nico's. It's a tremendous casual counter service Greek concept. Dimitri the Sun, you know, was sort of born and raised into the business. So working with him... Uh, uh, on the succession planning, mom slowing down, him taking over, and how to do that uh, was tremendously satisfying. Uh, so uh, we've got a lot of examples, you know, you know, like that, where they may not ever become a national or regional uh, household name, um, but they will operate correctly, they'll grow, they'll be profitable, they'll pass it on to their children, and that's, you know, just tremendously satisfying. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine. So uh, tell me a little bit more about what you're doing now. Now I get to spend time on what is just tremendously enjoying for me. I've retired from, say, contract consulting, so I'm not going back into that business. But I spend more time now helping others that are consulting. I work with advisors regularly. I work with a group that you may have heard of, the Small Business Development Centers. Uh, there's about 1,100 of those centers nationwide, and I contract with them to help their advisors understand the principles they need to know in order to help small independently owned restaurants. Uh, they, they, they work with a tremendous amount of small businesses nationwide. 
And so I'm doing a lot of um, Zoom webinars. I'm doing a lot of classroom instruction. I help them with some of their clients. Uh, and that gives me more time to um, write. I'm doing some work with my friends at restaurantowner.com. Uh, that's a wonderful website, for example. In fact, I think it's the single best uh, collection of operational data for the small guy, for the small independently owned restaurant wanting to grow. Uh, and anyway, I'm helping them with some additional services and we're updating some materials. And uh, and then I get to host Corner Booth, which is a gas. Um, it's a podcast. You know how much fun they are, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Barry Schuster, who's the editor of Restaurant Startup and Growth, and I get to visit with uh, independently owned restaurant operators. And we we talk about, you know, their stories and their challenges and um, um, and that kind of thing and uh, follow follow them. So between some of the podcasting and writing and networking with other advisors, I'm staying busy, but it's really light work, you know, so I can call it retirement. It's all fun. fun <laughs> Good. Good. Hey, uh, based on your experience in consulting, um, what uh, maybe is one thing or a few things that are often overlooked by people who are kind of excited about opening a restaurant brand, but you know maybe they maybe they didn't think of one aspect of it that would be key. Uh, there's a couple. Yeah, there's a couple that pop into mind that seem to be, um, you know, uh, repetitious that seem to come up. And one is. Restaurants seem to be tremendously attractive for people who have been successful in other businesses. You know, I, I don't know why, but I mean, somebody might spend 20, 30 years in oil gas distribution. They can't wait to take early retirement so they can grab their mother-in-law's marinara recipe and open a pizza jar. Um, countless people will say, I just want a consultant to help me with my idea. I want to open up a bar, you know, like, like the ones I went to when I was in college, they don't have bars like that anymore. And, you know, and so we, we seem to be a very attractive industry to people who are coming from having worked successfully in others. And so, so the challenge is transitioning their knowledge because this industry is, is different. It is tight margins, um, and, um, extremely competitive. And I think those are some of the things we have to teach people when they come is that this industry requires a tremendous volume. I think people are surprised at how tight the margins are, but we call it a lot of dollars going in in order to get a lot of dimes in your pre-tax profit. Now, sometimes, of course, you can get more than 10 or 11 or 12 percent, but a lot of smaller startups uh, operate on less than that. So I think those are the couple things that come to mind that uh, consultants have to do a really good job of, which is educate that person entering our industry um, on some of the new nuances, things that they're just not used to. And, and one is that, the tight margins. And the other one is the extreme cost. Too many times people think they've got a good idea, can't wait to open up my restaurant, I've set aside a couple hundred thousand, I'm ready to go. And then they start when they, you know, build that budget, they realize, Lord have mercy, there's some personal guarantee on the lease. There's money I have to raise from a bank. Banks are very hard to work with. It costs two to three hundred dollars a square foot just to build the sucker. That's before I get equipment, inventory, et cetera. Lord have mercy. Um, so I think between the transition to the tight margins and the um, cost, which is typically twice what they're thinking, uh, those are two things consultants face uh, with startups today. What is some advice you give um, restaurateurs about facing the competition? You, you mentioned that it was a very competitive industry. Yeah, yeah. You really have to see how you can fit in with an established buying habit, number one. Let's try not to recreate the wheel. Some people feel like competition means I've got to go do something dramatically different. You know, I'm the only guy doing whatever this, you know, I'm the only guy who's inventing, uh, you know, how to stuff brisket into an egg roll. Okay, I'm the only guy who can, okay, well, sometimes it isn't about how to be that different. It's more about fitting into an established buying cycle. Are you a convenience concept? Are you a, a medium priced a multi market concept? Are you more of a destination fine dining fit into a, a trend that's established? Then create your own point of distinction, you know, so find your way of putting your own little spin on the pull boys that you wanted to do or something unique about the way you're going to do your build your own pieces. So fit into an existing buying habit. Don't try to go out there and be so totally different that you're teaching the public. That won't work. How important, oh, go ahead. How important is it to be close to the competition in terms of proximity, you know, like location proximity? 
Well, it kind of depends on the concept. For most concepts, it's, just, it's very important. Some of the busiest restaurants are surrounded by other restaurants. In fact, some of the most successful restaurant companies develop more than one concept. And then what do they do? They build them right next to each other. Um, it's like the mall theory. You know, um, you go into a mall and you see, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten different women's shoe stores. You know, to the, uh, you know, to the naive eye, you would say, isn't that stupid? Why are all these guys here competing for the same women's feet? No, it's not. They know what they're doing. Um, you're, you, you're, it's more about sharing the customer base than it is trying to be alone and creating your own customer base. What are some, uh, maybe something to keep in mind when it comes to management of the staff at a particular location? Well, now that's getting more and more important. You know, right now we're hearing things about people aren't coming back to the industry post COVID. We have a labor shortage. No one wants to work. Um, and, um, uh, there are three things that I repeatedly tell anyone who will listen or anyone who asks that. And that's please don't be left behind. Be the winner. Uh, labor is challenging, but there are people winning. And the way they win by following three E's. The first one is embrace the change. Don't sit there and think that this post-COVID market is coming back to the way it used to be. And there are many people that think that. It isn't. <clears throat> it's a different world with employment now. Embrace that change. Okay, get, get in. The, and the second one is engage with staff. The winners are the ones that realize it isn't just about hiring and paying people anymore. We've got to develop an atmosphere where people feel a sense of belonging. So I've got to engage with staff. I've got to ask them uh, for their input, their suggestions. I need to sit around a table, not just with my two or three managers once a week, but how about every couple of weeks getting the key staff that want to sit in and let's give them a complimentary cup of yogurt and let's review things that might help our brand or our, our customer experience and let's get them involved and, and, li and listen Listen, if you're engaging your staff and you're listening to them, then you're helping them feel like this is where they belong. And then the third one, and this is normally the tougher one for the more experienced manager, and that's empower your managers and staff. Today's ownership really needs to be more about leading by direction, be there for support, review, evaluation, but not so much the hands-on. Today's employee wants to feel like they're in an atmosphere where they belong, they're listened to, they are part of the process, and then they're directed. And then, by the way, they're congratulated. Um, notice the small things. Um, you don't want to just, you know, have one big monthly contest and congratulate the winner. <coughs> oh, excuse me. That went out with the employee of the month. Mm -hmm. Kind of make sure that you are closer now and you've empowered your shift managers and your staff on their duties. They know that you're there to support them, but not there to, you know, handhold every step of the way. And then you review them regularly. You compliment them daily. Um, so this way you're building a team. You're not just employing people anymore. What, what do you think is a difference between um, a good manager and a good leader? Um, a manager manages situations. So a manager, by virtue of definition, needs to be more control and manage. Step by step, follow the checklist. And I'm not saying that this is a bad thing. But when it comes to handling people, you want to take that really good manager and develop him or her into a leader. Because a leader is somebody who can actually engage with others enough to, to set an example for them to do their managing. So it's like a, a leader is able to get those principles uh, set as an example for others to follow. Uh, and that makes the managing part much easier. You talked about um, the importance of being adaptable, especially now during this time of the pandemic. How has uh, success in the restaurant industry changed from pre-COVID to now? Well, uh, we follow the buying habits and we can see that the good news is people love restaurants. People will eat out. We learned that through COVID. Uh, that it is not a luxury, as some people may have thought in the old days. Uh, no, no, no. Dining away from home is, um, is a part of the daily fabric. We do it at all levels. We do it with young families. We do it with couples without children. We do it as we age. It's what we do. So that's the good news. The not so good news is we have to adapt because people are doing that in a different way now. 
So, you know, if you just think that people are going to come back to your dining room, well, that's only part of the program. We need to be able to reach out and sell our product the way people are wanting it. They want their, they want their restaurant. They want their quality. They want their variety, but they also want it, now want it more convenient. So if you don't have a really good online presence, if you don't really have a really good uh, pickup car side uh, type of program, if you're not reaching out with social media to keep people informed on the family packs and what they can pick up and the third party delivery, then you're missing the way the market has gone because people want things much more convenient now. So, so that means you've got to follow your buying trend. You've got to be a lot more technologically astute now. Um, in order to keep up and hold on to your uh, customers, you uh, with all the with all the challenges associated with the restaurant industry, you know everything to do with COVID, the narrow margins, the competition, all that stuff. What is it about the restaurant industry that's so kind of invigorating and keeps people like you around, and uh, you know people do it for their their life's work? You know, I just think that it's a principle about following your interest. Um, I, I would say that to anybody, you know, the best way to succeed really and feel good about yourself is to follow what you're most interested in uh, and then just be as successful as you can at it. You know, you got to follow your passion. So, I mean, just because you're good with numbers, for example, unless you are really passionate about working with numbers, please don't be an accountant, you know, uh, just be good with numbers. And I think what draws people to hospitality is that there is a need, I think, for people to feel good about uh, working with people. And that's what hospitality is. It's, it's a people business after all. I think people enjoy uh, the atmosphere of service, uh, the immediacy of gratitude, the, uh, the development of team, the things that happen in hospitality. Um, and then because we're dealing with likes and dislikes and food trends and things that continue to change, it's an industry that keeps you on your toes. So um, I think that might be part of what, you know, draws people. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's, you know, I don't mean to be discouraging, um, you know, to people who are looking at this from another industry. They can't wait to leave their job and jump in because it isn't, you know, that it's that hard to be successful. It's just that it is risky. We don't ever want to, you know, uh, underestimate the challenges. So I always like to tell people that coming into our business is not about being scared. It's about it's all about being prepared. You know, so if you are entering the industry and you will take the time to be prepared, you will study the market, you'll develop a business plan, you will budget correctly, uh, then you have every opportunity as anyone else does to succeed today. I have one more question for you, but first tell me how people can find out more about what you're up to or get in touch with you or check out your podcast, The Corner Booth. Oh, absolutely. You can find Corner Booth uh, anywhere you like to look for podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, Google, um, or you can go right to restaurantowner.com. I would encourage people to go to that website. Um, I do an awful lot of writing on that website. You can find me there. Or uh, at any time, people can uh, email me directly at chris, C-H-R-I-S, at chrisstripoli.com. Uh, my final question for you. I saw on your website um, that a key thing is to be afraid of mediocrity. Why do you say that? Why would you put that there? Why do you say that? You know, I'm glad you brought that up because it is true. It isn't just enough, you know, to be in the business. <laughs> um, you've got to make, because it's competitive and because people know so much more now about dining out, I think we can thank the Food Network for that, but people are more astute now. So just because people demand to go out, just because people like going out, doesn't mean they have to be in your place. So you don't ever want to rest on your laurels. I think I think the reason I make such a big point out of anyone that I work with about not accepting mediocrity is that that's where you don't learn. When you're stuck in mediocrity, you're 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 accepting the word satisfied. Satisfied is no good. Good. Um, you want you want to create a loyal guest that, that that will come back and bring others. Satisfied guest is just there, and you can't figure them out. Um, uh, it's almost easier to work with a dissatisfied guest because if you can work with them and find out where you missed, you know what to correct. But mediocrity just keeps us <clears throat> going through the motions. It doesn't identify where we need to improve, and it doesn't challenge us to get better. So be very very fearful of mediocrity. <laughs> Sure, sure. Hey, Chris, it's been fantastic to talk with you today. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. So long, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Top Business Leaders Show, powered by Rise25. Visit rise25.com to check out more episodes of the show and to learn more about how you can start your own podcast.